Hello, I'm Jennifer Moore, founder of The Dolphin Method and prenatal vinyasa yoga. Thanks for joining me today as I talk about why prenatal yoga, especially prenatal vinyasa yoga, can have such a huge impact on the pregnant body and be a great preparation for pregnancy, childbirth, and the postpartum recovery period. I'm also gonna show you three prenatal yoga poses that pregnant women should do every day and explain why they're so beneficial. I believe pregnancy is a time of huge transformation, a time a woman or person can get in touch with their own personal power, beauty, and capabilities. I believe that it's important to build your strength and learn about yourself in preparation for labor and parenthood. Prenatal yoga can be an amazing vehicle for this transformation. Prenatal yoga is more than just exercise. It involves the mind, body, and the spirit. It can be so transformative because more than any other time in her life, when a woman is pregnant, she's willing to take care of her body and do whatever she needs to ensure her health and the health of her baby. Usually when we work with yoga students and give them suggestions of things to practice, they don't all have the motivation to do what's best for their bodies. In pregnancy, that all changes. And when they practice prenatal yoga, it can have profound effects. Here are some of the benefits of practicing prenatal yoga and why it's so important. The first thing is that yoga teaches us connection to the breath. When we're doing yoga, we connect the breath to the movement. We move with every breath. We take slow and deep breaths. And we breathe into places in the body that need to be filled up and that need to have space. When we connect to the breath, we're stimulating the parasympathetic nervous system. This means that the heart rate lowers, the fight or flight response also relaxes. And this increases positive hormonal responses like boosting endorphins, and it decreases stress hormones. And stress hormones are hormones that can be really detrimental to the body. They take energy away from the uterus and the reproductive system. Yoga also teaches us the practice of staying present and in the moment. And this has been shown to raise pain tolerance. Also, staying present increases her knowledge of her own body and helps her get in touch with her body to know what she needs in pregnancy, labor, and motherhood. Prenatal yoga can also have a really big impact on improving fetal positioning. Movement and balancing of the body, especially in the pelvic and abdominal areas, increases the likelihood that the baby will be in a good position or be able to move into a good position more easily, which promotes faster, less complicated, and less painful labor. And because their bodies and babies are more balanced, they have less chance of unnecessary interventions and cesareans. You can see here all of the muscles of the pelvic floor. When they get out of balance, this can actually create imbalance for the uterus, therefore creating imbalance of the baby's position. There are ligaments that connect the uterus to the pelvis. These get out of balance really easily because of everyday activities. Yoga can help balance out these ligaments and be really helpful in creating good positions for babies. Another reason that yoga can be so beneficial is that it contributes to a more comfortable pregnancy. 70% of pregnant women complain of some kind of back pain during pregnancy, and doing yoga really helps to decrease discomfort so she can enjoy her pregnancy more. There are things that you can do every day to help the, the pelvis and the lower back stay more in balance and have less pain. 
we have ligaments that connect directly to the sacrum and to the lower back. When they get out of balance, this can cause back pain. Yoga actively helps to lengthen and balance out these ligaments. And lastly, one of the most important reasons to practice prenatal yoga is that it promotes an easier recovery from pregnancy and childbirth. In my experience, women who practice yoga during pregnancy are able to come back to doing yoga sooner after they deliver, which aids in stabilizing their mood, feeling stronger, having more energy, and recovering their bodies sooner. Also, their bodies recover more easily because they've built up strength and flexibility. Imagine how badly your body would hurt if you ran a marathon and you didn't prepare your body for it. You would spend days or weeks trying to recover. The same is true after you have a baby. If you prepare your body, if you build up strength and flexibility, you build up stamina and prepare yourself mentally as well as physically, your recovery postpartum will be much easier. Now I'd like to show you three yoga poses that pregnant women should do every day. These poses are great in helping to avoid back pain, help with fetal positioning, help with uh, balance of the uterus and um, all of the muscles and ligaments around it, and help with pelvic mobility. I'd like to demonstrate one of the best yoga poses for pregnant women to do every day to help maintain balance for their bodies and their babies and help to reduce lower back pain that is so common in pregnancy. Let's begin by going over the alignment of cat-cow. Okay, so Lorraine is gonna help us to look at this pose. In cat-cow, you have your hands under your shoulders, your knees under your hips. And it's really important that you get this part of the alignment correct. It seems really simple, but if you have your hands too far forward or your knees too far back, you actually can create too much stress on your lower back. So you can see if Lorena brings her hands forward too much, then the belly is hanging down and putting a lot of stress on the lower back. So if she has her hands under her shoulders, she's gonna feel a lot more supported. The other thing that I wanna mention in this pose is that you wanna make sure that you're doing a really supportive breath. For this, we use something called the Ujjayi breath, but a really gentle version. So as she inhales and exhales, She'll just slightly constrict the air at the back of the throat, making a little bit of a sound like the gentle ocean waves. You don't want it to be too loud. At the same time, during the exhale, she's going to imagine that she's gently hugging her baby in to her body. And she should feel that hugging sensation all the way around the back as well as the front. This is gonna really help her from over swaying her back too much. It'll help to support the abdominal muscles so there's not too much strain on them, and it'll help to support her lower back. All right, hands under shoulders, knees under hips. The other thing I want is for her to spin her hands a little bit out so her first finger is pointing forward. This is gonna give a little bit of extra rotation, external rotation to her shoulders. When women are pregnant, they have more fluid in their body. And so it's, things can get a little bit more compressive. So if we create more space in the shoulders, this pose is gonna be a lot more comfortable. There are some things that we want to avoid in cat-cow. All right, and I'll be talking about those next. All right, let's look at the cat-cow pose now. As she inhales, she's going to gently look up, give a little bit of sway to her lower back. You want to be careful not to sway the back too much. And then as she exhales, she's going to round her back. Just let her head relax down and really press the center of her back up to the ceiling, tucking the tailbone just slightly under. And then inhale again, lengthen the spine, a little bit of a sway. Exhale, 
Round the back, tuck the tailbone under, gently hugging the baby into the body. And then coming back to the center. We want to avoid overswaying the back. We also want to avoid any pain or discomfort. So if she has pain in her knees, we can pad the knees. If she has pain in her wrists, we can do modifications for that, which I'll show you in a moment. And if she has any, um, any other discomfort, like too much stretching the, in the abdominal muscles, then she can back off on the intensity as well. All right, let's look at some modifications. So some people, when they're pregnant especially, have a lot of wrist and hand pain. Really common. If you do, this pose can be quite uncomfortable. So what we can do is modify the wrists. You can modify it either a little bit or a lot. Let's start with the least modification. So the first one is you can take a small towel like this and you can place it either on top or under the mat. I'm gonna place it under the mat. And so it makes a little bit of a ridge. And then she can place her palms on the ridge, her fingers on the ground, and that's gonna decrease the amount of flexion in her wrist. So instead of this, she'll have this. Okay. And that is gonna make this pose a lot more comfortable. If someone needs more support than that, let's go to the next level, you can do a larger towel. Let's back a little bit. There we go. And go ahead and place your wrist here and fingers on the ground. Now make sure that the hands are far enough forward so that you're really getting the, at the very edge of the towel. And you can see that is gonna decrease the flexion of her wrists even more. Much more comfortable for people to do it this way as well. You could also use a wedge. So if you have a yoga wedge at home, one of these, these are really comfortable as well. You put the tall end facing her and the short end facing the front of the mat. Slide this over. And go ahead and try that. This supports the whole hand a little bit more, which is why I like it, but not everyone has a wedge at home. <laughs> um, they're pretty easy to get. And bring your knees back just a little. I put that a little too close to you. There you go. More comfortable? Yeah, you can really feel a difference. Now, for some people, they need to have almost no flexion of the wrist because their wrist or hand pain is so intense. So if that's the case, go ahead and come up. You can just use your fists so she can make two fists like this. Now you can see she has no flexion in the wrist at all. And this can be really comfortable for some people. Not so comfortable on the knuckles, but it, it's better than having wrist pain. The other thing that you could do is you could come on to your elbows. So for this, you're going to need a couple of blocks. And you can come on to your elbows. And that way there's absolutely no wrist flexion and she doesn't have to worry about any wrist pain here at all. Another option is using a ball. Coming forward over the ball, she can just relax either on her elbows or she can completely relax bringing her head down or even to the side. Good, and then release. Now, sometimes um, women, when they're pregnant, have a lot of heartburn. And so if they do, they might have to raise up their chest a little bit. When someone's having heartburn, we want to keep the heart above the level of the hips. So if that's the case, she could use a ball again, and this time just stay on your elbows. And that way your heart is above your hips, but you're still getting the benefit of leaning forward. And I'll tell you why that's so important in just a moment. All right, I wanna talk about some of the benefits of this pose because it has so many benefits. The first thing is that cat-cow encourages really good fetal positioning. And what that means is that when the baby is inside the uterus, it takes a lot of different positions. So some of the positions are maybe head down, sometimes babies lay sideways, sometimes babies are bottom down, head up. 
And by about 36 weeks, we want babies to be in a head down position. Although there are many places in the world who are just fine to deliver babies who are in a breech position, it's just a little bit more complicated. Um, and there are some places where they will not want to deliver a baby in that position. So um, if we want to keep a baby in a head down position and also in a position where it's going to fit really well into the pelvis, then we want to create an atmosphere of balance around the uterus, so the muscles around the uterus, and the ligaments that attach the uterus to the pelvis need to stay in balance. Cat-cow really helps with that. So here's a picture of the broad ligament. This is a ligament that is forming from the outside of the uterus, and it attaches all the way in the back of the pelvis, and it helps to keep the uterus stable. Here's also another picture of the uterosacral ligament. This ligament attaches from the bottom of the uterus, it goes around the rectum, and it attaches to the sacrum. So keep these picture of these two ligaments in your mind, and we'll come back to cat-cow. So go ahead and move into cat-cow again. So in cat-cow, you have the belly hanging down. So what's happening is that these ligaments are being stretched. They're being lengthened. So the broad ligament that's attached to the back of the pelvis and the uterosacral ligament that's attached to the sacrum are being drawn into a lengthened position because of the weight of the uterus. Okay, come up for a second. So why is that important? It's important because when you are sitting down a lot during the day, especially when we're doing things like lounging, where we're leaning back, those ligaments, the uterosacral and the broad ligament, they get really contracted. They get shorter because the weight of the uterus is pulling them back toward the back of the pelvis. And when you're in these positions a lot, those ligaments are going to settle into a more contracted state. And that can be an issue because then when you get up to walk around, those ligaments are going to all of a sudden have to lengthen and you can get sacrum pain and you can get back pain, lower back pain. And as well, it's going to affect where the uterus is sitting in the body and that affects the position of the baby. So this is why I think cat-cow is one of the best poses you can do every day. Let's look at cat-cow one more time and talk a little bit more about how it's really good at balancing out the ligaments of the uterus and the structures around the uterus. So if she does cat-cow, so inhale, lengthen the spine, look up. Exhale, round the back. You can see how we're kind of rocking the baby in the pelvis. This is going to help you move your baby into position that's more comfortable. It's gonna allow the baby to have space so that it can um, get into a more comfortable position because the belly is hanging down, which is creating space between the baby and the spine. Good, and release. Okay, so that is cat-cow pose. Please do it every day while you're pregnant. It'll really help you to reduce lower back pain. It'll help maintain good balance in the body, and it can also help to maintain good positioning for your baby. Let's take a look at downward facing dog and the pregnant body. When you're pregnant, doing downward facing dog every day is a great addition to your daily exercise or yoga routine. Lorena is going to demonstrate the alignment and how to get in and out of the pose safely. So Lorena, can you come onto your hands and knees for me, please? So starting on the hands and knees, she's going to bring her hands slightly forward and then curl her toes under, lift the hips up, moving into a V shape. This is downward facing dog. Now, when you're pregnant, you might notice that the belly is touching the thighs a little bit. And so if that happens, she can bring her feet apart um, a little more. Yep. 
And so she is more comfortable. So she doesn't have the belly hitting the thighs. It's okay if the belly touches the thighs as long as it's comfortable. But if it's not comfortable, move the feet apart slightly. The heels don't have to touch the ground. But if you want them to touch the ground, you could take a towel or roll up the back of the mat and place them under the heels. And then you have a little bit of extra support. You can get a little bit more of a hamstring stretch. You could also do things like lifting the toes up, which is gonna engage the front of the legs. And that's gonna help release the hamstrings a little bit too. So some things that you can think about, all right? If she has wrist or hand pain, go ahead and come down onto your knees, then we can use a rolled up towel of any um, any size, so a small one or a bigger one, and place it underneath the mat. And she can place her wrists on the rolled up towel and her fingers on the ground so she ends up having a little bit less flexion of the wrist. And this is really going to help somebody who's having a lot of hand or wrist pain. Okay, go ahead and bring the knees down. If that's not enough, you can use a larger towel or you can also use a wedge. A wedge um, is really nice because you get a little bit of more stability for the hand. And you want to have the thick side facing her body, the thin side facing the front of the mat. And again, she can place her hands on the wedge. And now she has a lot more um, length in her wrist. And so if you're having wrist pain, this is going to help a lot. Okay, thanks. All right. It's also really important when you're doing downward dog that when you come out of it, you bring both knees down at the same time. That's going to help keep your pelvis a little more stable coming out of downward dog. All right. Downward dog is a really great pose to do when you're pregnant because, first of all, it helps with fatigue. So a lot of times women get really tired, especially in early pregnancy, and this can be really, really helpful. It also lengthens a couple of the ligaments that attach the uterus to the pelvis. Take a look at this picture of the uterosacral ligament. This is a ligament that connects the uterus to the sacrum. This ligament gets really compressed when you sit down a lot during the day or if you're leaning back against uh, a soft sofa or a soft chair, this ligament is gonna get shortened. You can also see this ligament here, which is the broad ligament. As well, it connects the uterus to the back of the pelvis. And this ligament as well gets shortened. When people sit down too long, when they're maybe sitting for work or they're sitting for long periods of time, and that these two ligaments are going to pull the uterus back toward the back of the body when a woman is sitting down too much or if they're getting shortened too much. And that can cause things like lower back pain and sacral pain. When we do downward dog, let's look at it one more time. Keeping those two ligaments in mind, you can see that in downward dog, the uterus is hanging down. So that uterosacral ligament that's attached to the sacrum here is getting lengthened. As well, that broad ligament is getting lengthened. So downward dog is a really good way to help balance out those ligaments to help keep the back feeling more comfortable. So it helps with back pain. And it also helps to keep the uterus in a better place in the body, keeps it more balanced, and also helps to balance out the structures around the uterus as well. And one more thing is the pelvic floor. So the female pelvic floor here, you can see in this um, model, is a series of muscles that hold up the organs of the body, especially the uterus, which is really, really heavy. And when you're pregnant, this pelvic floor gets a lot of work. It has to work all the time, whether you're sitting, whether you're standing, no matter what. In downward dog, she's in this kind of position where the baby is coming up out of the pelvis. 
and it's giving the pelvic floor a rest. So downward dog can be really good for helping to balance out the pelvic floor, to help give the pelvic floor a little bit of a rest. And, um, and when the person comes back from doing downward dog, back into a seated position, the pelvic floor has a chance to kind of readjust. When I first started doing prenatal yoga in 1998, most of the practices did not include downward dog or any inversions. People were really afraid to do inversions. Um, I remember asking a lot of yoga teachers and even doctors, why can't we do downward dog? It feels so good in my body. And I didn't get any good answers, except that people really just didn't know. There was a lot of fear around having pregnant women invert back then. Um, I asked one doctor, I remember, and he said, you can't do downward dog when you're pregnant because it will disorient the baby. I was like, wait, this baby that is floating in amniotic fluid, like upside down, is going to get disoriented? How do you know that? <laughs> Have you done any research? So um, fast forward to today, after many years um, and many people doing downward dog for a long time, now it's actually recommended for pregnant women to do a semi-inversion like downward dog every day of their pregnancy for at least 30 seconds because of all the things I talked about before, because it helps to balance out the pelvic floor, give it a rest. It helps to balance out the ligaments of the uterus that, um, that will help with the position of the baby and help with back pain. So really, really great to do. If you need a modification, like I said, you can either um, prop up the heels you can use wrist modifications. If you want to, you can actually do this with the knees down. So you can use blocks, or you can um, use a block if you need to, or you can come onto the knees and bring the elbows onto the ground. So it's not the same as downward dog, but you do still get a good angle. So for people who have um, issues with doing a full inversion, this could be an option as well. Okay. And um, the other thing I want to mention is the hand position. So come back into downward dog for me. In downward dog, I like to have the first finger pointing forward, which means you have to spin your hand slightly out so the first finger is pointing forward. This is going to create more space in her shoulders, and that's going to really, really help um, if she has a lot of um, extra fluid in her body, if she's having any edema, but also just to free up the shoulders so it doesn't feel as compressive. Thank you. All right, there are some times when you don't want to do downward dog. So here are the contraindications. First of all, if it doesn't feel good, don't do it. Really important because sometimes you might have a condition like high blood pressure or something and not know it. But if you go into downward dog and that's the case, you might feel like it doesn't feel good for you. So it's really important to pay attention to that. If it doesn't feel good, don't do it. Another time when you might not want to do downward dog is if you have heartburn. Um, it's not going to necessarily hurt you to do downward dog with heartburn, but it very likely will make the heartburn worse. So I have some of my students who say, I'm doing downward dog anyway because it feels so good, even though I know that my heartburn might get worse. Um, that's up to you. But a time that you don't for sure want to do downward dog is someone who has high blood pressure. So anytime a person has high blood pressure in yoga, we tell them not to do inversion. So downward dog is a semi-inversion, so we don't do it with high blood pressure. There's also an eye condition that is called glaucoma, um, where it's really important not to have pressure behind the eyes. And doing an inversion like downward dog does put more pressure behind the eyes. So if you have glaucoma, no downward dog. Um, and then there are a couple of other times that you want to avoid downward dog. One of them is if you have a lot of amniotic fluid, like too much amniotic fluid. This is usually discovered very late in pregnancy. 
Um, and if it is discovered, many times people are not going to do yoga anymore. They usually will go to the hospital. Um, so if someone knows that they have too much amniotic fluid and they are under the care of a doctor, um, we want to stop doing downward dog at that point. Um, and then one other time has to do with the position of the baby. So by 36 weeks, we want babies to be in a head down position. Now, it is okay in some places for babies to be in a head up position, and they can be delivered vaginally that way easily. But depending on where you live, many places want you to have the baby in a head down position by 36 weeks. Because at that time, there's a lot less space for the babies to move around. So it's harder for babies to flip around into a um, head down position after that time. So if you have had a baby that's been in a breech position or a bottom down position, um, and you successfully do things that will help to turn the baby into a head down position, once the baby is turned, we stop doing downward dog for one to two weeks. We want the baby just to be coming down. We want to encourage positions like bound angle. Will you demonstrate bound angle, Lorena? So this position we want to do instead, that's going to open up the top of the pelvis, allowing space for the baby to drop down into the pelvis more easily. So no downward dog, only if you have one of those contraindications. If not, you can and should do downward dog every day of your pregnancy all the way until the day you deliver. It's a great pose to do. It can help in so many ways. So hopefully this explanation of downward dog helps you to be less afraid of doing inversions when you're pregnant and helps you understand the extraordinary benefits of this pose. Let's explore the squat position and the pregnant body. Squats are used in childbirth and pregnancy throughout the world. They are an amazing preparation for childbirth as well as a good pelvic floor lengthener. Let's look at how to do the squat and then we'll look at some benefits and contraindications. All right, so first when you're doing the squat, you wanna make sure that you have something to sit on when you're pregnant. You can do the squat without any props. That's fine if your body is really used to doing the squat, but for a lot of pregnant women, you have more fluid in the body and it's much more comfortable to have something to sit on. So I'm gonna demonstrate using a bolster. Um, right now you can see I'm using a block. Lorena is going to be our um, pregnant model <laughs> and she's gonna demonstrate by using a couple of pillows. So we are going to make sure that whatever we're sitting on, that our feet are near the top of it so that when we come into the squat, we don't wanna be sitting at the back of whatever we're sitting on. We wanna be sitting near the front, otherwise we, don't, we might roll off, okay? So for this, we are going to have the feet parallel, just a little more than hip width, bend the knees, Place the hands down onto whatever you're sitting on, turn the feet slightly out, and then come down into your squat position. You can place the elbows to the inside of the knees if you want and the hands in prayer, but don't press out on the knees. That was, that's was that been really popular for many years to press the knees out. We don't want to do that during pregnancy because you have a hormone in your body called relaxin, which can allow you to overstretch. And we don't want to be putting force on the hip joints in this pose. So um, in this pose, you can stay for a few breaths um, and you can either be sitting on a bolster a couple of pillows, or a couple of blocks. All right, to come out of the pose, we can do the same thing. Place the hands down, lift the hips halfway up, parallel the feet again, bring the hands onto the thighs, and slowly come up. You can st stop halfway if you feel a little dizzy or lightheaded, and then come all the way to standing.
Okay. Now I want to look at some modifications because there are a lot of different ways that we can use the squat that can be more comfortable for different bodies. So the first thing is you can, like I said, you can have any elevation that's right for you. Um, and you can also elevate the heels. So for some people, when you do the squat, um, you have really tight ankles. And if that's the case, then you might notice someone coming down into a squat and they're up on their toes because they can't bring their heels all the way to the ground. So in order to alleviate the stress on the ankles, we can elevate them slightly. So you can use either a rolled up towel or you can use a wedge um, or you can just use a rolled up yoga mat if you want. So I'm going to place this here and I'm going to have Lorena come back into her position, this time with her heels elevated. Okay. And then you can bring your hands down onto the thighs, onto the block. There you go. And then coming down, turning the toes slightly out. Good. Now her heels are elevated. And so that's going to put a lot less stress on her ankles and it can be much more comfortable. So you can have them elevated a little bit or you can have them elevated a lot depending on the ankle flexibility. The other thing that you can do is use a wall. So sometimes if people don't have a lot of flexibility or maybe they have their way they're carrying their baby, this is not comfortable for them. They can go to the wall. So Lorena can take um, her pillows and place them against this ball that's against the wall. And I'm going to take a couple of blocks and also place them against the wall. So you can either come down onto your pillows or your blocks. Same thing. Turn the feet out slightly, coming down onto your blocks. And then you can lean back against the wall and you don't have the compression of the belly in this pose. So it's really, really nice and comfortable. As long as you make sure that your knees are above your hips, because that is one of the most important things about this pose. And let me show you why. This gets us in to the benefits of the squat. Okay. This is a female pelvis. And when you're doing a squat position, What's happening is you are opening up the bottom part of the pelvis. So this pelvis has, let's say, has three different parts, right? We have the top part here, which is the superior opening. We have a middle part of the pelvis, which is right here, these two little bones sticking out. They're called the ischial spines. That's the middle. And then we have the bottom of the pelvis, which is from these two sit bones here to your tailbone. When you're in the squat position, your pelvis is doing this. The sacrum is getting pulled back and the sit bones are coming out to the sides. So you're opening up the bottom of the pelvis really, really wide. If your knees are above your hips, you're going to be getting this big opening at the bottom of the pelvis. However, if your knees are at the level of the hips or lower, you're actually going to be opening up the top of the pelvis instead. So if we want to get the benefits of the squat position, we want to make sure that the knees are above the hips. Now, when we open up this bottom part of the pelvis, it's really great to balance out some of the muscles of the pelvic floor because it's going to help them to lengthen. So at the bottom of the pelvis here, you have a bowl of muscles. And these muscles have a lot of stress on them when you're pregnant because you're, they're holding up this big, heavy uterus and a baby. And um, they end up getting out of balance sometimes. So when we do the squat position, we're actually lengthening these muscles, which is going to help to keep them in balance because we need them to be strong in order to help have the strength to push the baby out. So really good to do the squat position to, um, to aid in lengthening the pelvic floor muscles. The squat also is going to help 
allow the bottom of the pelvis to open up so that it can open up when you're actually delivering the baby. So the last place the baby has to go through is this bottom part of the pelvic floor. And so when that happens, um, the, those muscles have to have the ability to lengthen to accommodate for the baby coming down. Okay. Um, stop. You need to go back up. You went, stop. A lot of people in the world will give birth in the squat position because it opens up the bottom of the pelvis so much. So it's really common for people to, at the for women to at the end of pregnancy, just naturally want to get into this squat position during pushing because it allows that great opening of the bottom of the pelvis. All right. When someone is pushing in this position, it also speeds up the progress of labor. The squat position, because it helps to balance out um, some of the, the pelvic musculature and ligaments, can help to relieve back pain. And doing a squat on a regular basis can help to um, increase the amount of opening that the, that the pelvis is capable of having. Delivering a baby in the squat position is great because you get so much opening of the pelvis. Not only you get the opening of the pelvis this way, but also when you're in a squat position, the muscles of the back are pulling up on the sacrum. And so they're actually opening up the sacrum this way. So you're getting not only the pelvic opening of the two sit bones, you're also getting the pelvic opening of the sacrum getting pulled back. If you're laying down in bed and you try to push a baby out that way, like this, like you see a lot on, in the movies and, and in hospitals, the sacrum can't move as much. So it's not gonna be able to open up as much as it can in the squat position. So doing the squat is great at the end of um, labor because it can open up that area more. It can increase the speed at which the baby comes down so it can reduce the pushing time. Okay. So just a little fun fact that doing the squat position when you are delivering your baby, you actually get about up to 30% more opening of the bottom of the pelvis than when you're laying down on your back with your feet back. So something to keep in mind. Okay, there are times when we don't want to do the squat position. So let's talk about when not to do the squat. The first is if she's having preterm labor. So Labor that is before 37 weeks pregnant is called preterm labor. And if someone is having preterm labor, we don't want to be putting a lot of pressure down on the cervical area um, because we don't want to stimulate any change of the cervix. We don't want to um, promote someone going into labor too early. So we will stop doing it if she's having preterm labor. So if she's having contractions before 37 weeks and her doctor has said not to do the squat, then you don't want to do it. Another thing is if she's having really bad hemorrhoids, um, that can actually um, make them a little bit worse because you're putting a lot of pressure in that area. So talk to your doctor or physical therapist before doing the squat if you do have bad hemorrhoids. Another thing we want to be careful of is if a woman is having organ prolapse. This means that her organs, um, either her uterus or bladder or rectum, are beginning to come down and they're prolapsing. If that's happening um, and she's been told by a physical therapist or her doctor to be really careful of doing squats or anything that's going to encourage more downward movement of the organs, then you want to be careful with that as well. Another time is if a woman has a condition called placenta previa, and it's complete placenta previa. What that means is that the placenta, which is what the baby is attached to, 
is covering the opening that the baby has to come out of, which is the cervix. If it's completely covering the cervix, then when you do the squat position, you're putting a lot of direct pressure down on that placenta. And some people think that might not be a really good thing for, um, for the placenta. So for complete placenta previa, we don't do the squat either. Another time is if she's having pubic symphysis pain. So this area right here in the pelvis between the two pubic bones here, this area is called the pubic symphysis. And it's an area of um, connective tissue, cartilage-like connective tissue, that is um, typically not really mobile, but it absorbs impact. Um, and so it enables the pelvis to move, but also keeps it together. So it doesn't move too much. When you're pregnant though, your body has a hormone in it called relaxin. And this hormone goes into all the areas of the pelvis and the rest of the body, <laughs> and it creates more ability to move. So it goes into all the connective tissue and lubricates it so that this area can actually expand so that your pelvis can accommodate the growing baby. And it also has the ability to have a little bit more movement, which is great but also can be an issue because if the pelvic, that area has too much movement, then it can get out of balance, especially if some of the muscles around or attached to the pubic bone are out of balance, then that area can get out of balance more easily. So if she's having pain in the pubic symphysis area, especially when she walks or goes upstairs or does a squat, um, then she should not do the squat. Okay. We want to have a balance between, we need to make sure that the muscles are in balance. So we want to make sure that we're lengthening them. We're getting opening evenly in all of the sections of the pelvis, but we also want to make sure that we're not overstretching and stressing out this area. So it's really important for her to also listen to her body. If the squat doesn't feel good, don't do it. You can prop yourself up as high as you need to, to make it comfortable. But if it's still not comfortable, leave it out. Um, so this pose is also contraindicated. Um, if a woman is in labor and the baby is really high up in the pelvis. So when she's in labor, the baby drops down into the pelvis and then eventually the baby turns and it's all the way down here. And when the baby's all the way down here, the squat position's great because it opens up, allowing the head to come through even more. But if the baby is all the way up here, really high, and you open up the bottom of the pelvis, then the top of the pelvis gets more narrow and it's harder for the baby to come down into the pelvis. So early in labor, don't do the squat through contractions. Maybe you can do the squat in between a little bit, but we don't want to be doing, you know, continuously being in a squat position. I, I've known people who said, I thought you're supposed to do squats all the way through labor. So I just did squats all the way through labor and, and it hurt and it didn't feel good and it didn't work. And that's because anatomically, the squat is only really good in labor at the very, very end when the baby is almost coming out then it's great to do the squat. There are a lot of myths about the squat, so I want to talk about some of those now. Many people tell me that they've heard that you cannot do squats in the third trimester because they will cause preterm labor. If that were true, then so many women would not be induced all the time. You could just do squat position and they would go into labor. That doesn't usually happen. Um, also, people tell me that they've heard you should not do a squat in the first trimester because it can cause miscarriage. Miscarriages are not caused by things like squat position. Miscarriages are commonly caused by um, something not being right with the developing embryo. Like the, not, everything is not perfect. Um, and so um, there's some kind of abnormality, and that is much more of a reason why people have miscarriage than doing a squat position. So, and when we're talking about doing the squat, remember that women all over the world use the squat 
all the way through their pregnancies. There are a lot of women who live in places where they use squat toilets, where they squat down to do, um, you know, to cook food, um, and they use the squat all the way through their pregnancy. So we don't have to worry about doing the squat at certain times of the pregnancy and not at others. It's more important to follow the language of your body and um, let it tell you if it doesn't feel good, don't do it. Um, if it does feel good, then great. You can do it all the way through your pregnancy. So as long as you don't have a, one of the contraindications, you can and should do the squat all the way through pregnancy. They're so beneficial. Thanks for joining me today. I hope you found this information beneficial and the poses useful. If you're pregnant, please practice these poses as often as you can to get the most benefit during your pregnancy. Please feel free to contact me with any questions.